good morning everyone. Welcome to Caledon Presbyterian Church. It's really nice to, to see folks here this morning. And this is the Sunday morning service for Caledon Presbyterian and Minterburn Presbyterian Churches. Um, for our call to worship, but our, our service with God's Word, our call to worship is from Psalm 16. Uh, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I will not be shaken. Uh, and we're now going to sing some of those same verses, there's a bit of an overlap, we're going to sing Psalm 16 verses 8 to 11. So let's stand together and sing. Mm -hmm. families 
or, or possibly slowly recovering, but it can seem so slow, Lord, give the patience that people need. And we pray that you will uh, continue to help us to be looking out for one another. Uh, Lord, we pray for our political situation. We pray that uncertainties will be resolved, that relationships will be built and that decisions will be made. Lord, we continue to pray for our health service and all the challenge of new variants and backlogs of operations. Lord, please be with the medical services, especially thinking of those around here, thinking of our local GP practices and our local hospitals, Lord. Uh, please be with all those services and give them the strength and help that they need. And Lord, we just pray for uh, this meeting coming up of the committee and the session in a week or two's time, Lord. Um, we pray, Lord, that we will just know your presence and your guidance. And that as we just think a little bit about where we're at and where we're hoping to go, Lord, that you will be the voice that we hear and you will be the one that we follow. And you will just guide us, Lord, to think about how best to, to encourage our folks in the church here, Lord, and to do the job that you have tasked us with. So, Lord, we pray for your presence at that meeting and your blessing on us as we, as we work to, to honour you here in Calvin. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So our scripture reading this morning is, uh, I always feel to warn people slightly, it's, it's one of the longer ones. Um, it's Peter's sermon in the second chapter of Acts. Now, it's not his entire sermon, obviously, because this will only take um, maybe two and a half minutes or three minutes or something to read. Peter's sermon would have been much, much longer. They spoke for hours back in the day. But it's Luke's summary of, of the main points of the sermon. So we're just going to read through that now. And um, it's verse 13 just to the end of the chapter. And um, if you're following your Bible, we're on the young screen. And I'm picking up on the very end of last week. So the Holy Spirit has come. Uh, all the folks in the upper room, as I'm calling them, they have all been filled with the Holy Spirit and they're all speaking in different languages that are recognisable to the people in Jerusalem. They've all travelled in from different places. And so people are wondering about going, what is happening? And then we start at verse 13. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He then starts quoting and he says, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, and uh, I've just been singing and reading about this, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your holy one see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath 
that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and he has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, or Yahweh said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Uh, God will bless his word to us. So, children, I can see children, it's fabulous. Uh, <laughs> um, and I don't have any props today, I was all kind of proud of myself that once one or two weeks I managed to have props, I don't have any props today, I just have a clue. So when I'm thinking of someone, who am I thinking of? No. This person, I'll ask you in a minute or so, this person had quite a bad temper. Um, so something with quite a bad temper. This person was a bit self-centered. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Being a bit, a bit bad tempered and a bit self-centered. I wouldn't know what either of those things were like. He wrote five books in the Bible. And he has a brother called James. Can anybody think who I am thinking of? In the New Testament, let me think what other clues I can give you before I ask for <laughs> Okay, so bit of a bad temper, bit self-centered, brother called James, wrote five books in the Bible. He looked after Jesus' mother, Mary, after Jesus was crucified and then went back to heaven, Jesus asked him in particular to look after his mother Mary. And that's because this guy was the only one of the disciples, as far as I know, who actually stood at all near the cross. All the rest had done a runner. Can anybody think who I mean? <clears throat> Jim. Jesus and ask, could we sit 
for your kingdom comes, one on your left and one on your right. Can we be the top, the top dogs? Can we be the, the most important people apart from you in the kingdom? Um, and they were told, no, it doesn't work. I can't. So that is John. Um, we, if you think about it, we realise how much just the Holy Spirit changed John. I can't believe I did that. That's shocking. Um, we realise how much the Holy Spirit changed John. He wrote the Gospel of John, uh, which is a wonderfully encouraging book. He wrote three letters, first, second and third John. Uh, and actually he would have focused very much on, on Jesus being the light of the world and, and just how much Jesus loves us. He's given us one of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Uh, so whatever John's temper and self-centeredness were, they kind of calmed down as the Holy Spirit worked in him. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, finish actually reading a couple. Am I going to finish? Yes, I am. I'm going to finish reading something that John wrote. Out of all the disciples, John was the one who lived to be an old man. None of the rest of them managed to do that. But John did, and he ended up on an island called Patmos. I think it was a punishment for preaching. He was exiled. He wasn't allowed to leave Patmos. And while he was there, God visited with him, and God showed him lots of visions of what all the events in this world look like but from God's point of view. And it's a really, really amazing, helpful book. So it's called Revelation, and I'm just going to read some very familiar words right at the end of Revelation. So these would have been, um, uh, these, this would have happened, John would have seen all this, and he was quite an old man. And God showed it to him. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them. Be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So John saw all these incredible things. That was the, the journey that his life took. Um, and so he's a really important and really interesting character in the New Testament. And we're going to come across him in the book of Acts very soon. Not today, I don't think, but very soon we will come across him. Um, so we're going to sing it together in a second. Jesus called them one by one. That's, that's good because I couldn't remember the title of it. But it's to the tune of Jesus Loves Me. This I know. So everybody knows that tune. Um, but first, just let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, as always, Lord, we are so thankful uh, for the children in our congregation, Lord. And we just ask for your blessing on them. Uh, Lord, we ask that you'll be with them, whatever they do today and, and this next week, Lord, whether they're at school or at home, Lord, be with them, keep them safe, keep them close to you. Uh, and Lord, we thank you for all these different characters that we come across in your word, lots of different personality types, lots of different experiences, uh, lots of different journeys, Lord, and it's, it's wonderful to be able to take a step back and just look at how you worked in their lives. Lord, we pray that you will be um, patient with us and work in our lives. Uh, and as every day, every week goes by, Lord, that you will bring us closer to yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus called them one by one. Let's all stand together.
think of our, our, our passage that we read, it was Peter's first sermon. It wasn't the first time we ever hear from Peter or hear his opinion or his thoughts about things, but it was his first sermon. Preachers all remember their first sermon. Uh, in my very first sermon, I'm pretty sure I cried. And in my second, I had a panic attack in the middle of it. Some very memorable experiences. And um, I have a story from R. Kent Hughes. Uh, I went to bring the book, but the story is, it was about students who studied under the great, great preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And as part of their training, they would be given a Bible passage just there and then and told to preach on it. So he was given the Bible passage about Zacchaeus. So apparently he said, his sermon was, Zacchaeus was of little stature, so am I. Zacchaeus was up a tree, so am I. Zacchaeus came down, so will I. And he sat down. I can't use this. Probably that's all he had, a smart man to just put by his head. Peter does a bit better than most of the rest of us in our first uh, sermon. Peter is brimming over with the Holy Spirit. He is brimming over with the Word of God. Clearly, the amount he's able to quote, he is brimming over from all those conversations with Jesus. He is clearly a changed man from the one who was skulking around the fire 50 days earlier, pretending that he'd never heard of Jesus, that he didn't know him. Peter was a, a very fearful man, completely transformed by the Holy Spirit. And, and he does so well in this first sermon. The Holy Spirit works so powerfully through him that the thousands listening to him are brought to the point where they're all, almost as one, turning to him and saying, what can we do to make things right? We have done a terrible thing. How can we be right with God? What can we do? For those of us who have not yet trusted Jesus, this really is the biggest question we're asked in this life. We've done terrible things. How can we be right with God? We have rejected him. What can we do to make it right? And for those who've trusted Jesus, uh, and might actually know how to talk a little bit more about faith and about trusting Jesus, about how to share it with others, Peter gives us a bit of insight into what that might look like. So first, Peter opens his sermon by answering the question he's being asked, is everyone drunk? He explains, this is before nine in the morning, they all get up very early, and he explains it's much too early in the morning for Jewish folk to be drunk. There's a very slight implication that that might happen later in the day, but at this stage, none of the shops selling food or wine are open, so that's not what's happening. Second, he goes on to speak about material they're already familiar with. And he makes it relevant to the day that's in it. He makes it relevant to them on that day. Takes a lot of material from the Old Testament and explains it to them in a way that they will understand and, and that will be relevant to what has happened when Jesus died. So the noise that they have heard, the talking in different languages by these uneducated men and women, he quotes this wonderful passage from the Old Testament scriptures. And just because of time, I'm only going to deal with the first part of this. It's um, verse 17. Um, that's cool to find it in the reading. Um, I'm only going to deal with the first part of this. It goes on to talk about um, very sort of apocalyptic language, which is, is probably at the end of time. Um, but for today, and for that day 2,000 years ago, these are the verses he was concentrating on. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. In other words, says Peter, this is what's happening before you. The prophecy is coming true. You can see it. You can hear it. Young and old, men and women, all have been filled by the Holy Spirit. God said this would happen in the last days. We are now since Jesus' death and resurrection in the last days. And it is happening. And then he starts to talk about Jesus. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Peter then continues to do something very similar by reminding them all about King David. These, um, we talked about this last week, these folks in Jerusalem, they were there for the Feast of Pentecost. 
and, and therefore they were pretty much the devout. They were the, the really uh, enthusiastic ones who had travelled from all arts and parts around about, but they would have had to travel a distance to be able to be there. So they're enthusiastic and they're committed, and that means they know their Old Testament scriptures. So he talks about King David, showing how when David talked in Psalm 16, saying to God, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. That David wasn't talking about himself, because clearly, says Peter, David did die, and he was buried, and he's been buried ever since. But instead, David, who was gifted as a prophet by God, David was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, to the coming of his descendant, and that the full meaning of the psalm is that the Messiah will not be abandoned to the realm of the dead. The Messiah will not see decay. In other words, Peter is saying to them, my fellow Jews, everything you know is right and true, but it's just so much more right and so much more true than you realize. The story is so much bigger. It's so much more amazing because of Jesus because of who Jesus is, and because of what Jesus did. This is partly what we want to be saying to folks we know, who, who maybe um, go to church because it's expected of them, or it seems like a respectable thing to do. Like the Jews that Peter is talking to, they all know the Bible stories, but they don't know what to do with them. We all know folks who know the Bible stories, but don't know what to do with them. They haven't seen that everything, absolutely everything, points to Jesus. And that everything will point to Jesus for all the rest of eternity. And that our only hope is in him. The other thing to notice if we're uh, talking to folks about faith is how convenient and handy it is to have a good knowledge of the Bible and to be very regular in, in reading our Bibles and just keeping that knowledge fresh. Um, otherwise, it can become a bit like a, something you, you thought about a month ago or a few weeks ago and you just can't quite remember, but you know what was really good and you're desperately trying to think, what was that bit of the Bible? To just be regularly reading the Bible and regularly praying puts us in a much better position to be chatting to people. Often, if I, um, I'm a bit chaotic and disorganised, but if I read something in the morning, I will find that it's perfect for the person I want to talk to in the afternoon. God uses these things. Uh, for what he is doing, for his plans and purposes. But Peter then continues to argue from David's psalm that having been raised from the dead, Jesus has now been exalted to God's right hand, and Jesus is pouring his spirit out on all who believe. So in verses 34 and 35, David's talking about God saying, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, Again, it's not about David. David is not at God's right hand. Jesus is. The disciples in Acts spend a lot of time teaching from the Old Testament scriptures and showing how they point to Jesus. That's a, a real go-to thing for several of the sermons in Acts. Everything points to Jesus. All the prophecies are about him. And for the Jews that they are talking to at that point, that is something they can understand. That is knowledge they're familiar with, they just don't know the whole story. But for the Jews that they're talking to, it's only been 50 days. We know this stuff so well, we're so familiar with it. But it's only been 50 days since the crucifixion. It's only been 50 days since all these men and women started going about the place saying, uh, we've seen Jesus, he, he didn't die, he's not in the tomb, he's been raised from the dead. 50 days since the rumours of those Roman guards having been overcome, having fallen asleep. 50 days since the account of this incredibly heavy, sealed, protected stone having been rolled away. It's just been in the past few weeks that lots of people in Jerusalem have seen Jesus, have been taught by him, have walked with him, have spent time, have eaten with him. All of this is probably as fresh in the minds of Peter's listeners as if it had just happened that morning. So fellow Israelites, says Peter, let me give you the inside scoop. Let me tell you about Jesus, and let me tell you what it's all really about. Uh, so reading from verse 22, again, it's just such a long passage, just to remind us a little bit, uh, or if you have your Bible, you can have a look. 
So verse 22 onwards, uh, Peter says, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves now know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. It's a clear and simple message. First, my fellow Israelites, he's very my fellow Jews, my fellow Israelites. First, my fellow Israelites, you all know about Jesus. All of you start to hear the thousands listening to me, you all know about Jesus. You all know about his miracles. There seems to have been very little doubt that Jesus was doing miracles. That he did them was widely known, widely recognised. The raising of Lazarus, everyone knew about it. That was part of the problem. Everyone knew, everyone talked. And so the authorities, they didn't say he wasn't doing miracles. They explained his miracles away, saying it must have been the power of the devil in him. That was why he had so much power over demons, which he publicly displayed again and again. Only a devil, they said, would be able to cast out demons the way that he can. And it's interesting, um, the fact that Jesus had power wasn't in doubt. We're brought back to the C.S. Lewis conundrum of who was Jesus. Well, he was either mad, or he was bad, or he was exactly who he said he was. Jesus did miracles. Everybody knew it. It was a very clear demonstration. Peter explains that the miracles, the signs, the wonders was God proclaiming to his people, the Messiah has come. He is here. This is him. It's like there's been big arrows pointing to Jesus through all these miracles. So Jesus showed who he was for those who eyes to see and ears to hear. All part of God's plan and then also part of God's plan. He was handed over to being crucified. Aided and abetted by wicked Romans and by you. Yes, you. Did he point at them? Did he just sort of eyeball them? What did he do? It was you that did it. And it probably would have been a very similar crowd. Uh, they were the Keenies. There's a very good chance the same folks would have been there 50 days earlier for Passover. Do you remember Peter's really saying? Do you remember Palm Sunday? Do you remember everybody being all excited about Palm Sunday, welcoming him? But do you remember then a few days later you were calling out for Barabbas and you were saying, crucify him, crucify him about Jesus. This whole time while Peter's speaking, the Holy Spirit would have been at work in the hearts of their listeners. Otherwise they wouldn't have come to faith. They'd come to faith because of the work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit would have been at work opening their eyes to the truth, opening their ears to what Peter was saying, and that growing sense of dread they must have felt as they listened to him. That dread when you realise you've done something really, really badly wrong, and more than that, you've been found out. Peter continues then in verse 36, uh, just reading a couple of verses um, from here. Peter says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I've been cut to the heart every time I read this. Jesus is the Messiah they've been waiting for. Jesus was the Messiah they've been looking for, they've been longing for, they've been watching for, they've been talking about. What will he be like? What will he do? And when he came, they killed him. And we should feel cut to the heart. We're part of it. I killed him. You killed him. He died because of my sin. He died because of your sin. That's very personal. We will be asked about that. Little wonder they all cried out, what shall we do? What can we do? Repent, says Peter. 
Show that repentance by obedience, by being baptized. And then you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit in the same way we've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And everything will change because the Holy Spirit changes everything. So in closing, what does it mean to repent? Well, very simply, repent, well, I say very simply, um, in a two and a half lines, where repentance is to turn away from the sin and the rebellion against God in our lives, to ask Jesus to forgiveness, to forgive us and to accept us, and to then live in a way that pleases him. I think I need pictures, though, sometimes for this kind of thing. I think I, as a child, I really struggled to get my head around this, but what does that mean? What does that look like? What did I do? And I always find this quite a helpful image. Um, there's no actual image, I'm just going to explain it. It's a very famous image. It's in the Bible, it's in John Bunyan, but I've always found it very helpful. For it's like there's two roads before you. Just imagine that with me, if you will. One's a big rough wide road. It looks really easy going. Looks straightforward enough. You can see lots of books you recognise. And it's the, the road to your own desires and your own plans. It's the I'm the boss of me road. But then someone points out that that road it kind of leads away from God. And it gets a bit darker when you go further along it. That's a short road. It's a few years of a mansion and you're running your life in the way you would like. And then it comes to an end. And if you kept going on that road, you end up in a place where God is not. A uh, place the Bible calls hell. The other road, two roads ahead of you, the other road looks a bit more difficult. It's narrower. On it, Jesus is clearly the boss. There's no messing. Because of him, everything on that road changes everything about us. It changes our direction begins to change our attitudes, our priorities, our values, our hope. It can be a hard road, but there's a joy and an assurance of being on that road. It's the right road. You know it's the right road. And sometimes we can see a way in the distance. It's a big, long road, and you see a way in the distance like a golden city ahead of you. You catch a glimpse of that city every now and again and it just makes you think of home. That's the Jesus road. We're all born walking on the right wide road away from God. The road that leads to the place where God is not. But Jesus came and died for us so we could change road. And on the Jesus road, he is always with us. No matter what happens, he will be by our side. And he will take us safely home to be with him there. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that road, Lord, that we can travel along with Jesus and it leads to you. Help all of us, Lord, to, to be on that road, to get to know that road, to live uh, in a way that honours you on that road. And if we're not on that road, Lord, help us to recognise that we're not, and that that is really the only road that leads anywhere. So Lord, just help us and be with us now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, in closing, we're going to sing, uh, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. <clears throat>
from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.